Okay, welcome to Prescott Junior RTC. We have a special guest here tonight for our hometown hero. Uh, we can actually call up your smiling face here, ma'am, on the uh, on the screen, whether you'd like to see it or not. <laughs> to introduce to my, uh, these are my hybrid cadets uh, from different schools across Northern Arizona. Uh, we are lucky to have the new uh, Prescott Unified School Board president uh, that runs the entire school of Preston High School. Uh, we also, for the guy out of towners, we have one high school, we have what, two middle schools and five? Five, five elementary. elementary schools that uh, she is in charge of the board, which helps set policy as well as coming down to <coughs> money and allowing you guys to be here. Uh, just to introduce uh, the cadets here, uh, we have Seligman, right? Seligman High School. I see Bradshaw, right? Bradshaw. We have Camp Verde. South Verde. South Verde. Cadet Seven. Where's Cadet You're in Camp Verde, right? South Verde. I'm sorry. Okay, we have North Point. And we have, where else? Any other, anybody else I've not mentioned? Ash Fork. Yes, Ash Fork. And we have Trinity Christian. So there's a lot of, a lot of, any other schools I did not mention? Well, we're in Prescott High School. We have some Prescott High School students here. So it's quite a diverse uh, population here in northern Arizona. Anybody have snow at their high school when they're leaving today? <laughs> I got a, these are the kind of times of year on Monday afternoons I get texts and go, oh, sir, is it snowing here? <laughs> so, uh, excuse me? It was a valid question because it was snowing there. But anyway, everybody give a round of applause for the senior. Well, I doubt I'll take 45 minutes. I don't, I'm not that spectacular. I don't have many things to talk about, about myself anyways. Uh, like he said, my name is Tina Seeley. And uh, he gave me an outline, so I'm probably just going to follow that and then leave time at the end for questions from you guys. So a little bit about myself is uh, I was born in Arlington, Texas, where the Dallas Cowboys are from. And yes, I'm a Cowboys fan. You have to be if that's where you live. There's no other options. I lived there until we moved back and forth quite a bit actually when I was a kid. Uh, my dad was in sales, so we moved between um, Fort Worth, Texas, to Phoenix, and then I also lived in North Carolina for a short period of time. But uh, when I was 12 years old in sixth grade, we moved back to Phoenix, and that's where I stayed. And uh, then we didn't leave again. Let's, let, let's do some geography. We have some time mm -hmm. here. Okay. Oh, Indulge me here. All right. Uh, we don't, I don't want to assume that some of these students know where Arlington, Texas okay. is. So let's see, did I call up I Google think. Earth? Yeah. All right, so we have a big picture of America then, and uh, and then this will blow down into the big great state of Texas, and this is really kind of the northern part of Texas, mm -hmm. right? Because so that's where the Dallas Cowboys, everybody knows where the Dallas Cowboys is. So Arlington is a suburb, sort of, of uh, Dallas. And where in North Carolina, you said? North Carolina. Where? Um, let's see, I was in kindergarten. What was the name of the little town that I was from? <laughs> um, that's on the other side of the world. From here. Yes, it is. So I want to say Gastonia. Oh, Gastonia. Yeah. Actually, I know where that little is. Little tiny. How? That was a small town, small, probably smaller than Prescott. Right on the border, South yeah. Carolina, North Carolina, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of a different type mm -hmm. childhood for somebody who ends up in uh, Prescott. Well, and that's where my dad was from. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. So cool. that's how we ended up there. I'm from Columbia. Just oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, ended up staying, like I said, in Phoenix. Went to high school at Washington High School in Phoenix, which I think our basketball team plays tonight. I think tonight. that's going to be the noise behind us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really yeah. Well. We were the Rams. We were purple and white. And then, after I graduated, I went to NAU, Northern Arizona University. I got my bachelor's degree in education. But I actually started in business, uh, the degree that I started realized halfway through that my heart wasn't in it and that I truly did want to be a teacher. And as you know, NA is a great teacher college. And finished there, student taught up there, and then I ended up getting a job down here in Prescott. That's how I ended up in Prescott, Arizona. And uh, went back and got my master's degree through NAU and then became a principal, a, a, uh, an assistant principal actually. I know the article said principal, but that, that wasn't accurate. I was assistant principal at Granite Mountain Middle School here in town. And I worked there for 10 years. I was a teacher for three and an assistant principal for seven years at Granite Mountain. So some of you um, may know that about me. And then um, 
when did I leave? I was trying to figure that out, how many years I've been out of education. I think about 10, my youngest daughter is 12, so about 11 years. I left when she was about one, and I started selling real estate. And I liked it so much that I left education. I actually tried to do half-time education, assistant principal, and half-time real estate. But it didn't work too well, and real estate started getting in the way of being an assistant principal. So left that and uh, went to real estate, and that's where I've been ever since. And about four years ago, I started my own company. It's called National Realty of Prescott. And I am the owner and the broker. The broker is the person who's in charge of all the real estate agents. So, um, and I'm right downtown next door to the Girly Street Grill. So that's a little bit about me. I am married. Uh, my husband's name is John Seely. He is a sergeant for DPS in Seligman. He lives up on I in Seligman and works the I-40. Um, I have two daughters. One is Piper Seely. She's 16, almost 17. She has a little sister named Sydney. And she is 12, and she's in seventh grade at um, Grand Mountain Middle School. And um, I missed education so much that I ended up getting talked into running for the school board about five years ago. It's a four-year term, so every time you're elected by the public, you have to serve four years. So I'm on my fifth year. Um, and I had a lot of teachers approach me and, and ask me to run, like I said, about five years ago and felt like it would be nice to have a te an ex-teacher administrator's voice on the board as well as a parent because when I ran we didn't have any parents on the school board. Now we have quite a few but at that time I was the only one who had kids in the, the school district. So I truly love it. It's a great experience. Uh, I don't get paid to do it. It's, um, it's volunteer being on the board. It's a small time commitment. It's not huge. Like he said, we, run, we do the school board meetings on Tuesdays in the evening. You might have seen them on TV. Uh, we, I have to, part of my job as the president is I have to make the agendas for the meetings. I have to run the meetings and sometimes I have to do things like this, public speaking, uh, different toward types of things like that. But really my job isn't a whole lot different than the rest of the people on the board. There are five of us, one president and then the other they just serve on the board with me, but most of the time we do pretty much the same thing. We're responsible for the same. I bring that up right now. Yeah. We're responsible for the same. So these are the school board members. Uh, here's a dumb question. Does the school board hire like the principal, like Ms. Hillig? No, we do not get, we're not involved in the hiring and firing of any teachers or staff. We are, mostly what we're involved with is, like he was talking about, the finances for the district and policy, making policy that the state tells us we have to make or the nation, that's what we're in charge of. We, we don't get involved in the, the small, um, we call it small, it's not really small, but the, the smaller um, runnings of the, the individual schools and the personnel. We have people that do that. Um, Mr. Smucker, Mr. Howard, that's why we have them. They deal with the personnel issues. Do you hire Mr. Smucker, the superintendent? Uh, we do. It's, it's kind of a long process. He does report directly to us. We are involved in that process, but we also have a committee. Everything that we do, any kind of hiring for principals or superintendents is a committee process. We hire a group of teachers, a group of uh, what we call classified staff, which are your custodians, people who work in the cafeterias, bus drivers, people like that to form a group and they help us decide who would be the best principal. Usually they'll pick uh, one and then, um, you know, that's their best candidate, or maybe two, and then we'll look at them and, and then interview from there and decide who we think is the best. So it's a long process. <laughs> what about, what, what caused you to become a school board member then? Uh, Did you think when you were sixth sitting in high school in Arlington, yeah. Texas? <laughs> no, no, Washington down Washington. in Phoenix, no, not at all. And that's funny, you know, it says on here, one of your questions was, what did you think you're going to do with your life when you're in uh, ninth grade and twelfth grade? And honestly, I don't even remember thinking about that when I was in high school, what I wanted to be. And, you know, another kind of funny thing is I always kind of knew that I wanted to be in education, but uh, I was always afraid that it wouldn't make enough money. And that's still, it's still today is an issue. And uh, tried to go into something else like business, and my heart wasn't in it at that time, and ended up going into education anyways, and, and really enjoyed it. I mean, I love teaching. I miss teaching. I miss all of that. And that's another reason why I did run for the board, because I did miss it, and I miss being around the kids and being able to um, come to the functions and still be part of it. Can we take questions? We have a question in the back. Yeah. 
Now, what subject did you teach? <clears throat> when you I, were at Grand Mountain, what subject did you teach? I taught language arts, uh, seventh and eighth grade language arts. I also taught PE, and I coached girls volleyball. So anyways, um, yeah, so when I was your age, I had no idea when, what I wanted to be. I just, the only thing I knew when I was in high school was that I was going to go to college. And my dad was a huge influence in my life. Uh, no one in his family had gone to college. So from the time I can remember, I don't ever remember there being a time when I didn't think that I was going to be going to college. He told me from day one, you will go if I have to take you every day and sit with you in class, you will go to school. And so I did, and I was one of the first... Um, girls, especially, to graduate from college from his family. Um, so it was kind of a neat thing, and, and that's why I, where I am today. And um, another question on here: What misconceptions did you have when you were young? Now that's kind of a that's a kind of a tough question. A misconception. You Maybe thought the old teachers were mean, right? And, <laughs> yeah, yeah or, or that they were all poor, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And that's not, that's not true either, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I had some good ones in uh, Texas, and I always tell Piper that it's so different to go to school in different states and then come back to Arizona because the curriculum is different in every state that you go to. You know, the state is in charge, basically, of what they teach. And so it seems like every time I would leave Texas and come back to Arizona, I would be really far ahead in math and science but maybe behind in the, in the reading part. And then I would leave here and go to Texas and I would be behind in the math. So it's, it's a little bit different. It's interesting to, to see the differences. And, and I, the teachers were, um, they were hard. I do remember that. You know, I we want you have, to know that uh, you know, a lot of times my old, other old cadets will come mm -hmm. visit me for Christmas because they're back in the local area or whatever. But I had uh, two cadets who were freshmen that went down to the valley and transferred for one reason or another uh, to large schools, mm -hmm. and both of them said they were not as strenuous as Prescott High School. Both yeah. of them. Really? They were far ahead in their sophomore year. And then also I had two cadets, one from uh, a military academy, and then one from a university called Auburn mm -hmm. in, in the East Coast. And they were basically said they were well prepared. They were they were not behind when they Good. got to these top level schools outside of Arizona. Right. So that's a testament to uh, Prescott School. And I hear that a lot too, being on the school board, that the teachers here do prepare the kids. And I think a lot of it, uh, you know, is determined by what classes you take. If you know that you want to go on to the university level, there are classes that you have to take to prepare yourself to do that or you won't be prepared. You know, if you always take the easy classes and you don't take, you know, a uh, full schedule your junior or senior year and you're always looking for the easy way out, you probably aren't going to be prepared for that level. But, you know, if you are and you're taking the higher level maths and sciences, I think you're going to be fine. So just make sure that you're preparing yourself. It's the only advice that I can give you as far as universities go. Um, my personal, one of the questions says, did your goals in life change? And I kind of talked about that just a little bit. Uh, they did. And, and like I said, when I was your age, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, we had an ROTC program at my school. And I knew a couple of kids in it, but not very many. Um, I actually went to a mill ball when I was a freshman, and it was for Peoria High School oh, wow. down there. Yeah, I went with another kid that, that lived in my uh, neighborhood. It was a good family friend, so I laugh when Piper goes to that. I went to the mill ball. <laughs> so um, my important family members, I'm an only child. My important family members are my parents, uh, my grandmother, who uh, has passed away several years ago, but, but probably my parents. They had high expectations for me from the very beginning, and... Um, always expected me to do my best. You know, they used to say, you know, what's the point of doing something if you don't do your best? So I still live by that today. Um, what do you consider important in having a successful personal life? That's a tough one, especially when you're trying to run a company and your husband lives out of town and you have a kid that's involved in everything at the high school and one at the middle school. and. <laughs> It's hard because you, you do have to divide your time, and, and it's hard for me to find time for myself, for my personal life. So most the things that I like to do is I, you, you start to adapt as you get older. The things that you like generally start involving your kids. So soccer is something that we enjoy doing. Believe me, I didn't like soccer. I couldn't stand it when she first started to play. I did not understand the game. 
at all. Well, it looks like, did you say you played volleyball? <laughs> no, I taught volleyball, but I actually played softball in high school. So you didn't school. make your daughters play volleyball? I tried. I tried. And neither one, I, well, my younger one likes it, but I think she's now picked soccer as well. Now, that's her dad's doing. John played soccer, so they took after him. But then you learn to love it and love whatever they love and, and you move on. But um, I like to go to the gym. I like to, like I said, go to their games. We like to travel. Um, I don't know how much you know about Piper, but her dad is actually from Northern Ireland. And uh, so she has a, her grandmother and grandfather live there, as well as two aunts, two nephews now. Um, all of my husband's family. Give me a, give me a place in Ireland. Um, they live right outside Belfast. Okay. County Antrim. Let me ask a dumb question. What continent is Ireland on, guys? Isn't that, isn't that Southern Africa? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I know y'all know this. All right, here we go. Ireland. How about that? What country is it near? England. Ding, 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 that it has a lot of fights. So here we are in North Carolina. Let's see where we can fly to for uh, Ireland. So, big picture. Big picture is uh, this is uh, Europe. And this is a dinky little, dinky little island off of Europe called England. How big are these countries in Europe? How big is England? Hmm. Texas, size, size of Texas? No. no. What? No. New York. California. Bigger? Yeah. You can fit like <laughs> six English <laughs> in Texas. <laughs> yes. England, this, this country right here is the size of Michigan, which is one dinky, mm -hmm. you know, it's an average size, not as big as Arizona, right? Size of Michigan. But it has 60 million people in it. Okay? And then this country, Ireland, is what you're talking about. Okay? And uh, you know, everything in Europe is much, much smaller. So therefore, Ireland, of course, there are no highways that are really worth anything. But uh, the, the whole, let's measure it. I'll, I'll do this, we do this for our other class here. We can, uh, we'll measure it and see how far it is for Ireland. <coughs> to actually go for, from one to the other. Uh, basically, to drive from the top part of Ireland to the bottom is like going from here to Tucson. The country, guys, the country. Except, there's no interstates. It's all windy little goat paths. It would probably take a day. <laughs> yeah. Maybe longer. Maybe yeah. longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, your husband then was born in the northern part of Ireland, same Belfast. He was actually born in London, but um, his whole they're from Belfast. That's a long story. But that's yeah. good. That's yeah. good history. That's good history. All right. I, by the way, guys, I, being in the military, if you want to travel, you probably want to join the military. My son, Luke, who is uh, 20 years old, was born right outside of Cambridge, England, uh, right with this, actually, right with this, this mm -hmm. uh, airport is right there. So I was stationed for three years there with my wife, who's from Arizona, but my son was born there. So he has. Two, two birth certificates, one in English, first certificate, and one American. He's, he's an American citizen. Mm -hmm. But that's what happens when you get in the military. You go all over the world. So we're kind of familiar with Ireland. Uh, my, my family's from Ireland, too. Yeah. Denny, my Denny family. So, never would think you'd end up in Prescott. No, so I'm sure he didn't. How did you end up in Prescott? Well, I ended up in Prescott because I got a job here teaching out of college. At a Grand Mountain? Or yes. A, mm -hmm. Well, first I was a substitute. I subbed for a half of a year and then. Um, then I came up here and got a job, and so yeah, at Grant Mountain Middle School. And my husband ended up in Prescott because he went to Embry Riddle and graduated from Embry Riddle. So. International school, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but he actually ended up moving to Southern California. His parents moved out of the the um, England, Northern Ireland area, and immigrated to um, Northern California in San Francisco and became naturalized citizens, and uh, he was raised in Southern California in Loma Linda. Cool. So, and then he ended up going to um, Embry-Riddle and graduated from there. So, and then became a police officer. I got a great idea. I've had, uh, I talked to these cadets, and I bet you about a quarter or a third someday talk about opening up a business. How many people here would like to have your private business and you be your own boss? It sounds like a great idea, you know? <laughs> being from, uh, and we've actually had from our our ROTC, I know for a fact, dozens of kids who have finished high school and gone mm -hmm. off to start a business. Uh, everything from making skateboards. Uh, we have two or three uh, 
artists who got into tattoos. They have businesses here in, in northern Arizona. We have, uh, of course, quite a few beauticians, construction uh, companies, that maybe with their dads or moms. So tell us about the idea <laughs> of going from a high school student to a business owner and what got you in there and some considerations. That would be tough. Um, to, to be a business owner right out of high school, I think it would be difficult. First, you'd have to find something that you truly love and that you were better than anyone else at, or at least you thought you were. Like I said, I ended up in real estate, and it was completely by accident that I actually own a real estate company. I had no intentions even of owning a real estate company four years ago. But the one that I was working for, I was just the broker for. Um, so you can be a managing broker or you can be a broker owner. I'm explain, a broker explain, owner. Explain what a broker, what do you have to do in education? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a different word. Um, to become a real estate agent, you have to go back to school and you take classes. You can take night classes at Yavapai, you can take some classes through independent people. And actually, I am licensed now to teach real estate classes as well. So you have to go to school, take classes, you have to go and you have to, you have to pass a school test, and then you have to go and pass a state exam. And then you can get your real estate license and you have to come up with a lot of money. You know, and that's the one thing about going into business for yourself. Realtors are what we call independent contractors. Um, people who do hair, cosmetologists, they're independent contractors. So although they work at a salon, they have a chair that they pay somebody else for normally, unless they own the business. Same with a, a realtor. I had to go back to school then for three more weeks every single day, 10 hours a day, to get what's called my broker's license. So I had more classes, had to pass another test and another state test and then you can be a broker. And then somebody has to hire you to be a broker or you're what's called an associate broker. So it's like, the kind of, you know, realtors here, then you can be an associate broker with the right classes. And then if somebody hires you or you open your own, then you can be the broker. The broker is, you can only have one broker that oversees all the agents. So I have 15 agents who work for me, under me, but they're considered independent contractors. So although I get a portion of their commission, they're still responsible for all their own taxes and keeping track of their own paperwork and things like that. So basically, I'm there to manage them and to make sure that they're staying legal, following the laws, not taking advantage of people, things like that. So that's, that's what a real estate agent, associate broker, broker, those are the steps there. And then, like I said, owning your own business, it just kind of happened for me. I, I was working for this company, and it was ERA, National Realty of Arizona, downtown. And the people who owned it were from Northern California and ended up going bankrupt. So I had, there were, at the time, there was myself and about 20 agents who had nowhere to go because we had to go to another company. You can't just sell real estate by yourself out of your house. You have to work for a broker or a company and a company. So we were looking for a home, and they came to me and just said, is there any way that you could open your own company? Well, I hadn't even thought about it until they said that. And so, yeah. So that's what I did. And, and then to do that, it's you know even more work. You have to go down to the state of Arizona, to the real estate, Department of Real Estate, petition them. You gotta run all these names by them. If it's close to any other name, they won't let you have it. So it was, it was quite an interesting um, four weeks. I think I opened my business in four weeks it took me from the time somebody asked me until we actually got our license and our doors opened. So it was exciting. Um, people think I'm crazy because I don't know if you guys remember four years ago because you were young. But that's kind of when the real estate market started to crash and things started to go south and market values started to go down and, and people started losing homes and all that kind of stuff. So it was difficult to open up a real estate company. But the, you know, the way that we looked at it as a group was we could only go up. It was so bad four years ago that it could only get better. And so it has. It's slowly but surely, it's, it's gotten better. and, and um, I think we're all happy. I've lost some agents over time because they had to go and get what we call real jobs, the nine to fives, uh, you know, going back to teaching. Some had to go back and, and uh, you know, work at Home Depot to pay their bills because they weren't selling enough real estate. The market was that stagnant or slow that they had to go get other jobs to pay for their bills. So, so we hung on to the 15 that we've got now, and, and we're doing really well, and the market seems to be coming around. I'm sure you've heard your parents talking about it, and you hear it on the news, but um, I've noticed a big difference just this month alone, which is good. So we're proud, and, and hopefully I'll be here, and maybe Piper will sell real estate someday. I don't know. She works in my office with me sometimes and does my paperwork and my filing. But um, 
you know, whatever you can do to get skills. You have to learn how to do things to get jobs, you know, whether it's filing or working for other people or helping others. Um, volunteering is a great way to do that. But just to leave high school and open a business, I can't even imagine. Like I said, I went into college and thought I wanted to study business. And I guess I'm glad now that I did because it probably helped me in my business. But I couldn't stand it when I was there. It was like pulling teeth just to go to class every day. Classes like statistics that, you know, I just couldn't even get my head around it. And accounting and things like that, I just thought were so boring. So probably now it's a good thing that I had to take some of those classes. But at the time, I didn't realize that it would benefit me in the long run. But yeah, I mean, by all means, it's, it is great owning your own business. It's great being your own boss. Uh, however, how many hours a week? Yeah. Give us an idea between your hours with the school board, how many mm -hmm. hours with the school board, or how many working. A lot of people think that owning your own business and being your own boss means you don't have to work as much. Right. And that's not true, especially in the beginning. I think when I opened my company, I was probably working 60 hours a week to try to get things going and advertising and the money. I mean, I keep bringing up money, but it's really expensive to start your own company. You have to have the supplies, the tools that you need, marketing. You have to get people to want to buy your product or come to you. I mean, how are they going to find you? How do they know what you're doing? How do they know who you are? So all of this costs money. So it took a lot of time and a lot of you know blood, sweat, and tears at the very beginning. Uh, now I don't have to work quite so hard because, like I said, I have 15 agents who work for me. But you can ask Piper. I mean, there, there are times when I work a lot, and there's times when I don't work so much. So it just depends. If I have my own transactions going where I'm also selling real estate, not just my agents, then I'm really busy. And for real estate agents, and you'll find with your own business, your phone rings all the time. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. They don't care. And so although you think you work for yourself, you really don't. You have clients, and you have people that are relying on you, you know, whether it's a skate, if you're making skateboards, you know, there's somebody that wants that skateboard, they wanted it yesterday, it's not done, you know, with real estate, it's how come my house hasn't sold, how come I don't see it in the magazine, or a new buyer, you know, when's my loan going to be ready, who do I call, what do I do, so, you know, although you're working for yourself, you really do work for other people, and, you, and your families, you're going to have families, and eventually someday that you're going to need to take care of, and, and um, you know, priorities. But it is nice. It is nice to say, you know what, I don't really want to go in today. I have something else I need to do. I want to go to Piper State soccer game on Wednesday. So I've put it out there. I'm not going to be around Wednesday. If you need me, call me on my phone, email, text me. But that's about it. I won't be there personally. So if you need something signed, because in real estate we have a lot of paperwork, just like teachers, you know, you got to get it to me before then. So I like it. I do like owning my own business. It's not for everyone. Some people do better working for other people. Uh, you know, and the military is a good example of that. I think being in the military would be a great foundation for somebody because I think it's very structured and I think that they teach you well in a lot of things. They teach you to be disciplined in life because in order to own a business, your own business, you have to have some discipline in your life. You can't, you know, you have to know if I only sell this many skateboards, I can only buy this many pairs of shoes next week. You know, you have to know what the limits are when to buy, when to sell, when to buy more equipment, you know, things like that. So you have to have some discipline in life and, and, you know, be able to say, well, we can't afford that right now or, you know, I can't afford that advertising, so I'm going to have to do this for my business instead. So it's hard. And you're also going to have employees if you own your own business. And they depend on you. They want you, you know, they, they want to pick your brain and, and talk to you all the time and run things by you. So, I mean, I like it. I do like it. Don't get me wrong. I think... Um, I got your website right here. I don't, need, I don't know if it's working. Somebody was just on it yesterday. <laughs> it said that it wasn't hooking up to the MLS, but... All righty. Yeah. There it is. That's uh, National yes. Realty of Prescott. Yep. Exactly. And then you have all your agents. Mm -hmm. These are the people who work for... Some have left. We have a uh, couple there that left. Tell me meetings. about hiring people. When you look start to hire people, what kind of qualifications are you looking for? Well, you have to have a real estate license, like I talked about. And we're kind of a small company, and most of us have been together for almost 13 years. Since I started as a realtor, a lot of us, we just have stuck together. We've all been in the same company. Um, in real estate, you can be one of two things. You can be what we call an independent company, which is what I am, or you can be a franchise. Century 21, ERA, Caldwell Bankers, those are franchises. We were an ERA, and then just decided not to be an ERA when I took the business and started my own. And the reason why we chose not to 
and this kind of gets into the money part of it, when you're a franchise, you have to pay Century 21 money to be a Century 21. They don't just let you use their name for free. So if you figure, you know, money-wise, it's about 6% of everything that we make as realtors would go straight back to Century 21, ERA, Caldwell Banker, whoever you're a part of, Keller Williams. They take money out of your check. So my agents at the time didn't see the value in the 6% anymore, especially being in a small town and already being a company that, for the most part, had existed for 30 years or more. Um, and I have a lot of agents who have been doing real estate for over 30 years. So we're a company that um, has a lot of experience. So when we take new people, which I don't do very often, but when I do, they have to fit in. When I, when I talk to them and I interview them, they have to have a license and that they have to fit in. Um, we're not a super competitive office. You know, we don't take business from each other. We work together and we're a team. There's 15 of us, but we're a team. Even though you make your own money and she makes her own money and so on, we still help each other. If you go on vacation, I'm going to cover for you and I'm not going to charge you money. You'd be surprised how many agents around town will expect a cut of your commissions to help you. So we don't do any of that. We work together, we play as a team, we sell as teams, and it, it just works well for us. So if you're a cutthroat, it's all about money type person, you're probably not going to work well in my company. Mm -hmm. So I know um, I know a lot of like real estate agents. Mm -hmm. Like when you first go in, you'll have like a mentor program. Yes. And they'll kind of like show you the ropes, and they'll uh -huh. be part of your uh, commission. Right. Has, do you have the uh, same kind of system? You know what? I'm your mentor. When you come work for me, we're a small enough company that um, I'm a mentor. I also have another agent whose name was on there, Audra Farnsworth. She and I started real estate together the same year about 13 years ago, and she's very good too. She used to teach agents. Um, like I said, I can teach. Uh, classes to become an agent, I can teach classes to become a broker, and I can teach um, what we call continuing ed classes. Once you become a realtor, you have to continue going back to school. You don't just get to stop. And it's the same with teaching and a lot of other professions, law, doctors. You have to keep going to seminars, classes, school. You have to keep getting credits, and you have to prove that you did. So we have to take every two years I'm a broker. I have to take 30 hours of continuing ed classes every two years, and then I have to report them back to the state and input all my certificates in that so that they know. Agents have to take 24, so I have to take a little bit more. But yeah, you got to keep going. You got to things change so fast in, in real estate and things like that. Yeah. So do you have to start out to um, as a realtor to mm -hmm. become a broker? Yes, you have to. In order to become a broker, you have to sell real estate, what we call full time for three consecutive years. So, and they ask me. So let's say you worked for me for five years. You would have to come with this sheet with all your classes complete and I have to sign this letter saying that yes indeed, you have sold real estate full time for three years and I have to sign it and say that you did. I have a lot of uh, agents who wanted to become brokers and I told them, I can't sign your paper, you haven't sold real estate full time. You know, because the market hasn't been strong or whatever your reason why you went back to work. So I'm not going to sign off on that because it's going to come back to me. Right. And what is full time? Um, full time for real estate. Sometimes they think of it as trans how many transactions you do, which is like how many houses you sell. Um, for me, you know, one a month would kind of be kind of a full time thing, or or maybe one every six months with this market would be pretty good. But you know, I want to see that at least you're in there trying. If you haven't sold a house in six months, that's probably not full time. Even though you're sitting in the office spinning your wheels, um, I want to see that you're doing things. So, yeah. And real estate's hard to get into. People think, oh, I'm going to get in and I'm going to make all this money, but it's not really that easy. It takes a lot of work, and you have to know people, and you have to market your people. So it's hard, but you can make a lot of money in real estate. You can. So. What was your biggest surprise in opening up your own company? My biggest surprise? Um, probably the hours that it took to get it going, uh, like we talked about at the beginning, and how much your people do rely on you. That was a big surprise because even though I was broker, you don't really realize um, what's going on in people's lives too and, and the things that you get to know about these 15 agents that work for me. I know almost everything about them, their husbands, their wives, their kids, what's going on, what church they go to. I mean, it, so it's interesting, you know, that you don't, you're not on that same level when you're just another agent in the office. So it becomes very personal when it's your own business. So that was, that was a big surprise.
A good one, but a big one. What about your education that they're going through? Is there anything you would have changed about your education now looking back on it? Is there anything I would have changed about it? That's a question I give, guys, uh, <clears throat> students that I'm writing letters of recommendations for college, for the Air Force Academy, or for ROTC scholarships. You guys need to be mature enough to look back at your education and decide, hey, you know, if I had to do it all over again, what would I do different? Mm -hmm. Um, at the high school level, I think I definitely would have um, taken more rigorous classes, especially my senior year. I was one of those kids I couldn't wait to get out. I think I went half day and then I worked at Dillard's at Christown Mall down in Phoenix. Um, and now, you know, the advice that I give you is stay in school. There's, what is the big rush? I get so frustrated when I hear these high school kids, I can't wait to get out, and they're juniors, and they're going online so they can graduate early. Why would you want to graduate early? So that you can go work more in your life? Because that's just one more year that you're going to be working. I mean, enjoy life. This, these are the best years of your life, and I know you're probably sitting there going, oh my God, high school, you kidding me, this sucks, I can't stand it, I want to get out of here. But it is the truth. You need to enjoy it and make it the most that you can. Join every club, anything that you're interested in, this is the time to figure it out. You know, if it's ROTC, if it's a sport, if it's a club, you know, give it a try. Because as you get older and you're, you're our age, you don't get those opportunities. They don't come around again because you won't have the time, you know, or you have a job. So don't be in a hurry to get on with your life. You have the rest of your lives to work, you know. Figure it out right now and, and be the people that you want to be. And, and, you know, take classes that you're interested in. And, and, you know, my other big thing is volunteer. That's my big thing. And I make my kids do it. Um, my husband does it. We all volunteer. You have to give back to your community. It's very important. And that's why I'm on the school board. If I wasn't on the school board, it would be something else. Um, school board isn't a huge time commitment. Like I said, we meet the first two Tuesdays of every month. We have to go to some classes and conventions a couple times a year. But it's visiting the schools and things like that that take up time. The spring is very busy for us on school board because that's when we start talking about budget and money. And you'll start hearing it from your teachers and stuff about budget cuts and this and that. So um, how much money we're not getting from the state, that's usually how our conversation goes <laughs> with that. But, but yeah, don't be in a hurry. Enjoy life. Take your time. Don't be in a rush. I think when I look back, I wish that I would have taken harder classes I wish I would have paid closer attention to the details. Um, I wish that I would have made um, better friendships in high school. I, um, I ha I, my best friend is still my best friend today, and we're, we've been best friends since eighth grade down in Phoenix. But um, you know, you rush through, and, and you don't make friendships that last. And I think that's really, really important, especially in a small town, because you're going to see these people probably for the rest of your lives. Um, and a lot of you, I know, you probably think, oh, Seligman or Prescott, it's a small town, I can't wait to get out of here. But if, I tell, if you knew how many people left and came back to this town and started their, their orthodontics businesses, their real estate companies, their tire companies, you would be surprised. This is a great place to raise a family. So don't be surprised if you find yourself back here in 20 years. Uh -huh. What's something you would recommend for somebody that was interested in real estate? Something that I'd recommend? Yeah, like well, you have to be 18, and then so you, have, you need to take your classes. I definitely would maybe, um, like you know, the young man in the back was talking about, find somebody that's in real estate and maybe hang out with them for a while, kind of shadow them, we call it job shadowing, and see if that's something that you really would like. Because you know, there are times in real estate where it's not busy. There are times when you're so busy, you probably will have to hire an assistant. But um, you know, maybe shadow somebody and see if that's something that you would be interested in. Looking on to the, looking into the future of uh, real uh, in Arizona real estate, uh, how does it look? I think it looks better. I think it's coming around. Um, commercial real estate starting to come back, which is good um, because the the residential portion already has started to come back. So now we're just waiting on commercial is usually the last and vacant land. So it's looking good. Yeah, it's looking good. I think we'll be okay. We have to get some tourists back here, but other than that, yeah. So in hindsight, do you regret going to business school? Because as a manager, do you use that accounting? And yeah. You know, no, I don't. I don't. Actually, I don't regret anything about college at all. Like I said, I think I probably do. When I was sitting there, I hated it. But now I'm kind of glad I had to take some of those classes. But you're going to find out when you first start in 
college, you're not going to take any classes probably that you're really interested in your first two years. You have to take your, your undergrad classes. Like I had to take, um, you have to take psychology, sociology, I had to take political science. There are elective classes that you have to take that count towards your credits even though it's not part of what your major is. So a lot of that was that, but then you start, my second year I started to get into some of the accounting and I just wasn't really in, wasn't feeling it, I guess you could say. But yeah, some of the other classes you have to take, you're going to find they're just classes, but, but they make you a, a well-rounded person. That's the point of them, so that you learn about things that maybe you weren't interested in and maybe you will be interested in it. You just didn't know. You didn't get to take psychology when you are in high school. But um, I, I, and I tell Piper this all the time, and she loves high school, but I, I always tell her that college is um, by far so much better than high school because you are in charge of your own life for the most part. You get to choose some of the stuff that you want to do and, and pick your classes and, and that kind of stuff. But it's not for everybody. College isn't for everybody. So that'll be the choice that you guys make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in high school, did you have the opportunity to do what we have here, the dual credits, to start getting your college credit in high school? No. When I was at Washington High School, we didn't have anything like that. We didn't even call it AP at the time. We, we, were, we just called it accelerated. So like I was an accelerated in English and math, but it didn't really count. Like AP, you get an extra point and things like that. We didn't have anything like that. But you could start going to JC colleges. Like my, I could have started to go to... Um, you know, like Phoenix College or something, my senior year, halfway, you know, if I wanted to. Right. But we didn't do that. I don't really know anyone that took those classes. We had kind of JTED, but it wasn't called JTED at the time. It was, it was, yeah, but even then it was, it was, what was the work program called back then? Career and Technical yeah, Education. Yeah, something like that, yeah, yeah, CTE. But so you could, if you're interested in being a nurse, you could do that. You could go to school half day and then go work you know, at a, a hospital. I had a friend who worked for a plastic surgeon half day. So yeah, it was kind of cool. And she's still my friend too to this day. We were college roommates. So. Guys, the, real, the reason, reason I make you guys volunteer <laughs> 10 hours a quarter yes. is uh, not, only, not <laughs> only to give back to the community because of how lucky we are to be in America. I think it's a great part of being American is volunteering. But also, I'm telling you, 50% of you, 40% of you, will somehow volunteer in something that you'll learn you love. Mm -hmm. Like kids who are at the VA, I have my daughter and some others who volunteered at the VA, like working with that type of situation, or here at the hospital, or at Home Depot, or with a construction firm, or at the church playing in a band. We have about three of our students are now musicians because of playing in a band. Mm -hmm. And so you'll learn something you love, or you probably learn something you don't love. Right. <laughs> you'll volunteer. <laughs> probably more times that one. <laughs> you'll I know volunteer I don't want to doing be. something, you go, man, this really stinks. Yep. I don't like cleaning up the side of the road, so you know what? I might not want to be a janitor. Mm -hmm. But I maybe like it, because you're mm -hmm. quiet, you're in control of the whole school. I mean, it just depends. So I'm saying the volunteering is for us to give back to the community, but it's also a higher personal adult level thing for you guys to do mm -hmm. and see what you like and don't like. And people uh, want that now. I mean, you know, all every college application that we've looked at together, it asks you how many volunteer hours do you have? You know, when you go and get a job, they're going to ask you that. Okay, well, you haven't had, you don't have work experience, so have you volunteered anywhere? Because to them, that's kind of like work experience, you know? I mean, you've done something for other people. Uh, you know, like I was telling Piper, the United Way needs help, I think, on the 12th because of the Yarnell fire. They collected all that stuff. Do you remember those warehouses of, of stuff that they collected for those families whose, whose homes burned down? They have to move it out of that warehouse and get it into a smaller area because people are building their homes so they don't have any place to store it. So um, the things that haven't been picked by the people for their homes, they're going to have a huge yard sale. So they need help. I mean, she came and talked at our, our realtor meeting and just said, you know, we're going to need a lot of help to run this yard sale. What because I think it's the 12th. Of March? Uh, no, of February, February. To get started, yeah. Well, saying, you might want to call Email us in, and I'll let my, okay. my Joey, is actually my vice commander, let him put it on the, on the okay. website. All right. Course. Yeah. We've got about three minutes, guys. Any questions? Any other questions around the, around the room? For What made you choose NAU? What was, you know, was there a guy involved in that, which I haven't heard a lot? There was a guy I was trying to get rid of <laughs> <laughs> that followed me, much to my chagrin, the week before school started, here he comes. But I'm joking, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, a couple days ago, whatever, last Thursday, I'm talking to one of my 
juniors or seniors, and I said, why are you going to this school? Oh, because Bobby wants to go to University of Oh, yeah. Of I know it. Don't make that mistake. Go where you want to go. <laughs> never, make a, never make a choice for a boy or a girl. But um, I chose NAU because for, I liked skiing, and I knew I wanted a small school, and I couldn't, um, I, my parents couldn't afford for me to go out of state. I knew that. And I didn't want to go to ASU because that's where I was from. And U of A was a little too big. So I chose NAU was kind of just a logical choice. It's funny because I don't remember ever really considering ever anywhere else. So, yeah. And it worked out well being a teacher. It worked out perfectly. It's a neat campus. It's, it's pretty. I like it. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, let's uh, give her a round of applause.